Let's kick this week off right, mentees. Let's take an advanced look at the amazing Spider-Man Omnibus Volume 3 reprint from Marvel Comics. So, stay tuned. Before getting started, a big thank you to David Gabriel and the folks in Marvel for sending us an advanced copy of this omnibus. This omnibus is due out in the direct market and the book market on November 16th. So that same day it will be released at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, CheapGraphicNovels.com, Tales of Wonder, Walt's Comic Shop, wherever you get your books. It's coming out on the same day. What we're looking at here is the standard edition covered by Mike McCone. To your left hand side there is the direct market cover by Gil Kane. And that was the direct market cover for the first printing and it will be for this printing as well. The one on the right is the standard edition cover that's available everywhere. Now I'm not sure if they are going to have different spines. I assume they will just based on what they've done in the past with Fantastic Four or Amazing Spider-Man Omnibus Volume 5. But here's the spine of Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3 reprint. So, oh, and please ignore this little nick there. That's just my copy. My dust jacket got ripped on the way here. But hey, what are you going to do? Review copies. But we're going to be doing a comparison here in a second. Uh, there's your ISBN. And then what it collects up here is a nice little blurb from the New York Times. But yes, what is an overview without a comparison? So on the left-hand side here is my original first printing of The Amazing Spider-Man Omnibus Volume 3. And on the right is the latest printing. Uh, the latest printing seems to have the colors just a little bit darker tone. That's about the only differences there on the cover. The spine, of course, being the biggest difference. So, no picture here. The font was bigger, volume 3, but the Marvel Omnibus logo is still the same. And the back of the book also seems to have changed a little bit with the design. The pictures are a little bit bigger here for the covers. So the thumbnails are a little bit bigger. Uh, the price is $125, and this one is $100. Under the dust jackets, we have the Amazing Spider-Man Omnibus, and we have the Amazing Spider-Man Omnibus in color. It's about the only difference there with the logo. Spines being identical to the dust jacket spines. And then the backs. So nothing here on the original printing, and that logo right there on the newest printing. We'll be looking at the internal differences here in a little bit, but first, let's open this up and show off the artwork and talk a little bit about the story. All right, let's go ahead and get this open. Start talking about this era of Spider-Man. So here we have some black bookend pages. There's Spidey right there. And we have the credits here. Most of the stuff written by Stan Lee. And Roy Thomas eventually comes in and writes some issues, breaking up that streak of Stan Lee's run on Spider-Man. And then we have the pencilers here, John Romita, John Buscema, Gil Kane. And then we have the inkers and finishers like Jim Mooney, who actually did a lot of stuff in here. John Romita also doing a lot of the finishes. Sal Buscema, Mike Esposito, just to name a few. And here is your table of contents. So this does collect the amazing Spider-Man 68 through 104 and then you have the covers to annual six seven and eight because those were just reprints we have the introductions here by john ramita i think he does two or three introductions stanley does one and those are all taken from the marvel masterworks uh, unfortunately they did not have introductions specifically for this omnibus it would be really cool kind of like what roy thomas was doing over in conan to see them do introductions for omnis i'd like to see that again and kicking it off with issue number 68 here. And it's the return of the Kingpin. And honestly, this issue right here sets up the Petrified Tablet Saga. And I think this is the very first long-running saga in a monthly comic book. So it went all the way from issue 68 all the way to issue 75 so the kingpin wants a hold of this tablet because they want to unlock its powers and then so does this other character named Silvermane. and the ending of this one man it's pretty controversial i think for its time it was pretty controversial how that particular saga ended but it went all the way to issue 75 so you have story like an ongoing story from issue 68 to 75 and it's interesting to read the behind the scenes about it because as comic book readers or as readers, as you know, when I was a kid, I thought they had these stories planned along like all the way for like a year or two. And some writers do, uh, but it seems like they were just playing it by ear, month by month. What character would appear, uh, the intro introduction of Silvermane, how to include uh, Quicksilver into the story, which this 
story is pretty interesting to see a character from the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, or I'm sorry, the Avengers rather, show up here. Kurt Connors gets involved, and yes, this particular issue. All the letter pages are intact, like in the original printing, so that is something you don't get from the epic. And I want to say, just recently, this some of the stories in here were in one of the recent epic, I think it's the Death of Captain Stacy epic collection. Yes, I know, I realize that <laughs> title has a spoiler, but what are you going to do? But yes, uh, some of the stories that are in here were collected in that particular epic collection. And during this time, it's also interesting how Stan Lee and J um, John Romita Sr., not Junior, but he was just going as John Romita back then, were writing the character of Spider-Man because it seems like the guy could not get a break. It was just like the entire world was against Spider-Man. Here we have the introduction of the Prowler. And if you read the introduction here by John Romita, you get to find out a little more behind the scenes of these stories, such as it was his son, John Romita Jr., that came up with the costume of the Prowler. So I didn't know that until reading it the first time around when I read this when it came out. But yes, we do have the Prowler, who plays a big part in Peter Parker's story during this time, because Peter Parker, well, he kind of messes up here a little bit, and the Prowler owes him a favor. So the way that he gets out of this mess that Peter Parker himself got into is he gets the Prowler to disguise himself as Spider-Man. And there, there's also something very interesting during this time, is if you've read Spider-Man Blue, this is that type of era during Spider-Man Blue. Spider-Man's sick, there's something going on behind the scenes that's playing at him. But if you read Spider-Man Blue, you get pretty much more of the behind the scenes of what's going on here. I love those type of stories. Uh, Kurt Busiek did an amazing job with Until Tales of Spider-Man in that very same fashion. Here we have the introduction of the Kangaroo. Probably not one of the most memorable characters but you have the return of other characters that are not doc ock it seems like doc ock was everywhere during this time but you do have the return of electro uh you do have also the return of who you saw a little bit earlier the lizard here we have the schemer and he does have a secret uh, that is revealed later on and we also have the introduction of vanessa here but one of the biggest characters that was kind of reintroduced through these pages or updated rather is this character right here the black widow now this has been collected like i mentioned in that epic collection it's been collected in the black widow epic collections and in the black widow omnibus but this is a very important story because this is pretty much john ramita saying hey stan i really want to write or i really want to draw miss fury stanley was like i don't know how about we just update the character of black widow and that's exactly what they did. So she gets a new costume. And this is the costume that, to this day, is still, when you think of Black Widow, you think of that costume. And here she is in all her glory. And then, of course, her story continues into another comic book. I believe it's the pages of Strange Tales. Uh, but here's Amazing Spider-Man number 87. This is the story I was talking about where Peter Parker is sick and he goofs up a little bit at a party. He's like, hey, by the way... I'm Spider-Man, everybody! And then how he gets out of it is by using the Prowler. Then we have the three-part story arc with Doc Ock. So it is the return of Doc Ock. Is he dead? Is he alive? Well, sure. Most of you probably know the answer to that. Doc Ock lives. But sadly, as I mentioned a little bit earlier because of the epic collection, there is a character that dies here. Now, during this time, Peter Parker and Gwen Stacy have a relationship. During this time, Peter Parker wants to share things with her he wants to tell her so badly that he's spider-man but after this particular issue he can't because the entire world blames spider-man for whatever bad things are happening i do want to point these two pages out so during this time and it was a very a small amount of time at marvel they started doing some experimenting with ads so what they were doing is they were placing ads at the bottom sometimes of panels, which is insane. You couldn't, can you imagine like people freaking out these days if they saw an ad in their comic book pages like this, like there were ads down here for, I don't know, Nike or whatever, but that's why you get pages like this sometimes. And you probably see them in some collections in the past. At least that's what I think they are. Uh, here's the issue with Iceman when Iceman comes in. And this is during the time when the X-Men were 
no more. They were taking a break. There were no monthly Uncanny X-Men or X-Men issues before the Giant Size 1 relaunch. And this issue right here is uh, where Spider-Man goes to London because he goes after his girlfriend because... You know, her father just died. She blames Spider-Man for his death, and Peter Parker wants to show how much he loves and cares for her, so he goes after her, which is kind of ridiculous because he's in London, right? And it's Peter Parker and Spider-Man are both in London at the same time, and he realizes, oh, yeah, people are going to put two and two together. Um, that was kind of a stupid move. This is also uh, when she goes to London where the horrible, horrible... Sin's past takes place, but you can read about that all for yourself. And then we get these issues right here. I believe it's issue 96 that kicks it off. So yes, it is issue 96. So one thing you probably have noticed and you know of and you're aware of is this right here. The Comics Code. So comics back then had to be approved by the Comics Code. This all takes place after, of course, EC Comics and the Seduction of the Innocent. So we created the Comics Code group here. However, there are three issues in this collection that are not approved by the Comics Code that kind of broke that. Uh, and they all have something to do with drugs and the use of drugs. And that's not even the main focus of the story. It's really about Harry Osborn, the Green Goblin uh, saga. But they do have a message here to tell about drugs and the use of drugs and the abuse of drugs. So these were not approved by the Comics Code. Pretty groundbreaking for the time, honestly. It really showed Marvel and the entire comics world that you didn't need comics to be approved by the Comics Code uh, to share a good message or to sell well, because the comics still sold. Pretty controversial, I'm sure, when they were coming out. That was a big, you know, people were probably gasping, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're doing this. Now I'm sure most people don't even know what the Comics Code even was. I mean, they all broke apart anyway in the early aughts. And then we get the lead up to issue... Oh, this is the Panic in the Prison, but let's talk about issue 100. So issue 100 being the final issue by Stan Lee of his consecutive run on Spider-Man. So here we have Gil Kane now drawing Spider-Man, coming in to draw Spider-Man. Because John Romita was just a busy guy. He could tell you in his forwards that... Unfortunately, you know, Stan Lee wanted him to draw other projects too, not just Spider-Man, even though he loved drawing Spider-Man. So one thing you'll see in here is a lot of big John Buscema coming in, whether it's doing the breakdowns or doing the actual pencils that are finished by John Romita or, or Jim Mooney. But as I've mentioned in my Conan overviews, Big John hated drawing superheroes. And I never knew that about him as a kid because the guy was such a pro. He was so good at it. I'm looking at Gil Kane's artwork right now, but talking about John Buscema, because that's how I do. Um, but yeah, the guy was such a pro that you didn't even notice. I mean, he was handing in some great A stuff to Stan Lee and John Romita. That's really cool. They didn't like drawing superheroes, but still did the work. Now, this is, of course, the big cliffhanger. Stan Lee's like, deuces, Roy Thomas. You got to figure out what to do with six arm Spider Man. <laughs> So that's one of the biggest cliffhangers, and Roy Thomas comes swinging in big by introducing the character of Morbius. Now, because of those issues, and I'm sure it has to do a lot of those, I'm just putting two and two together here, that were not with the Comics Code approved, they started being a little more lenient about things. So they were like, okay, you know what? Comic books can use vampires and werewolves again. So the word vampire was restored in comics again. So now we have Morbius. The Living Vampire, introduced in the pages of issue 101. That's one of the biggest introductions in Spider-Man during this era. Gil Kane providing the artwork, and you have Roy Thomas drawing... I'm sorry, <laughs> Roy Thomas writing the stories. But it's all about Michael Morbius. And then you have the story of Kazar and the return of a Spider-Man villain. And the introduction of one of the biggest, and by biggest I mean size-wise, Spider-Man villains that... Shows up randomly years later in the 90s. But that's all that's collected in here. Let's look at the extras. So here are your Spider-Man annuals. The covers, again, because they were just reprints. This is an artist, a self-portrait of John Romita. It's cover sketches here and original cover art. Unused pencils, unused pencils by John Romita. I have no idea who owns these, courtesy of 
John B. Cook. Thank you, John B. Cook, for letting Marvel use those scans. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine owning unused pencils during this era? That is such a good cover. For, for such a powerful issue, that's such a good cover. This is the Color Roughs. This is the Return of Electro. Uh, the book, by the way, has 920 pages. I did want to show this, that the original <laughs> had the comics code, but then they were removed. Um, but they did end up removing the pills from Harry's hand there. I want to say that was the first comic that dealt with drugs um, right before DC did theirs. I could be wrong, and by all means, I am not opposed to being told I'm wrong, so let me know in the comments. Here are the reprints of the Marvel Tell covers. And then other type of reprints, like the reprint of Marvel Tells here, uh, that used a brand new piece of artwork. Covers for collections, collected editions, and trade paperbacks. John Romita. That's John Romita in the early aunts drawing those covers. Bruce Tim drawing covers for the Essential Spider Man. Mike Wieringo, Marvel Select Spider Man. Again, more reprints. That is a powerful cover here by Sean Chen. That must be, yeah, I was going to say, that must be early Sean Chen's art. And John Romita always did love this cover here. I always thought it was Chris Bacalo. Apparently, I was wrong. It's Oliver Coppel. And there is the Masterworks covers. And, of course, if, in case you don't have the Standard Edition cover, here is the Standard Edition cover all the way in the back. Now, as far as the binding, it is sewn binding. And here is the eye. This printing, by the way, was printed at the iMac printer. Now, let's do a comparison with the first printing. All right, so let's go ahead and get these open and talk about the differences. Uh, the original printing having this marble slab finish to the bookend pages here. Uh, and the original printing was printed at the Donley printer. So that is one difference and the new printing printed at the iMac printer. And I'll be 100% honest with you right now, the paper quality seems just as thick as this printing here, the original printing. Both printings seem to have about the same type of thickness to the paper. I know it doesn't bother some people, but some people really want to know those kind of things, so I don't mind talking about it. But yeah, it seems like... Oh, sorry. Got two pages there. It seems to be about the same, yeah. All right, let's look at some artwork to compare the covers here. All right, so here we have the very first comic collected in here, The Crisis on the Campus. And... Honestly, I don't see any differences at all. Maybe it's a little bit darker over here in the new printing as opposed to the first printing. And I mean a slight bit darker. That's about the only differences I see there. So let's move on to something I noticed last night when I was rereading some of these stories. And that is this page right here. So it looks like the scan for page 174 was a bad scan because it's a little bit brighter than the scan on the original printing. See how the colors are just more vibrant than here? They're a lot lighter. Seems like the, the it was just a bad scan. That was the only page I noticed throughout this omnibus, uh, but I didn't finish reading it, I'll be honest. I, I, I got to about issue number 75, the very first story arc, and that was it. And that's something that rarely happens with reprints. Usually they take the original masters and use it again at the printers. So that's a very rare thing to see. Um, again, just showcasing that same issue. And the artwork looks identical. The colors look identical. I did find another page here. It's 179. Scans are lighter than what they're supposed to be. Now, one thing I'm going to say is that I don't know if that's going to be every copy or just this copy. I've seen both cases where it's just a couple of copies that are like this, where the inks were running low or the colors were running low, or it could be just a bad scan. So I'd love to know whenever you get your reprint to check out those pages uh, to see if these pages are as light as the ones here on the new printing copy that I have. I wanted to stop here to show this page. 
uh, mainly because I love this piece of art here by John Buscema and Jim Mooney. Uh, but in this one, it looks like the colors are lighter in the new printing as opposed to the original printing. Yeah, it seems like this particular issue seems to be running just a little bit lighter. You can tell through these pages a little more than you can when it's darker when they're using lots of blacks. Let's do a couple more pages and then move on to another issue to do a comparison. Yeah, it's running just a little bit lighter than the original printing. Here we have a later issue that I was talking about with Spider-Man accidentally revealing his identity. And this here looks to be the same colors. The brightness, the tones of everything, the contrast on the colors all look the same with that phenomenal final page right there. As a matter of fact, this is so weird. The new printing on this particular issue looks like it has a little more vibrant colors than the original printing. Very, very slightly just vibrant colors. I was always a fan of this page right here because of the angle of the splash page. Uh, but the colors seem a little more vibrant in the new printing. So it's kind of hit and miss, uh, maybe with the specific issues. I'm not sure why. But other than that one page that I noticed in this one that just had a bad scan... Now, as far as the extras, they're all in the same order. Colors look identical. Yeah, so that's it. That, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing this book, don't forget to check out our sponsors. CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for brand new graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They pride themselves on packaging your books so they arrive safely and in an excellent condition as well as prompt and helpful service. Check out the bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. CGN is excited to announce that they are now taking pre-orders. They are making it easier for you to ensure that you don't miss out on the hottest releases. CGN is currently running a special promotion for you minties. If you're a first time customer, let them know that you were referred by near mint condition at the checkout and you'll receive a credit for free shipping on your next order. This promotion is valid for U.S. customers only. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with a kind of deep discount and quality shipping and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and the comparison to the original printing. Let me know in the comments down below if you've missed out on it the first time around and this is your chance to get it. If you're hoping they do an amazing Spider-Man Omnibus Volume 4 reprint and how far you would take the collection. Would you go all the way past Roger Stern's run? Do we need an Alien Saga Omnibus to match up right up against the McFarlane Michelinie Omnibus? If you have any questions, please leave your questions down below. Again, this was the Uncanny Omar. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to smash that like button. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. Ring that bell for notifications. We are on Spreadshop and on Patreon. Amazing ways to support the channel if you can do so. And more importantly, everyone, stay healthy, stay safe out there, and much love.